questions, anything at all about what I just said. Okay, well then, uh, why don't we, uh, on this uh, uh, Reformation Day, stand uh, for our opening hymn.
beloved, in the Lord, as we joyfully gather this day to recall together that we have been justified by grace through faith alone, and that because of the gracious favor of our God, we are freed from condemnation for the sake of Christ, our dear Lord. Let us respond to this wondrous mystery by devoting our lives to him and repenting of our sins. Do you confess to Almighty God that you are a sinner and in need of forgiveness? Do you confess to our merciful Father that you have sinned against him in thought, word, and deed? Do you believe that our Lord Jesus Christ died for you and shed his blood for you on the cross for the forgiveness of all your sins? Do you pray, God, for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of his beloved Son to be gracious and merciful to you? Do you believe that God, infinite in mercy, slow to anger and abounding in kindness, truly loves and cares for you, and even knowing all your sins, graciously forgives you, ever draws near to you, and intends everlasting joy for you in the peace of his eternal kingdom. Finally, do you believe that by Christ's gracious promise, the forgiveness that I offer you now and in this holy setting is indeed God's forgiveness? Then let it be done for you as you believe. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. steadfast in your grace and truth, protect and deliver us in times of temptation. Defend us against all our enemies and grant to your church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for readings from sacred scripture. Without the mic. <laughs> Revelations chapter 14, verses 6 through 7. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through 28. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. And for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the rightness, righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was, was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. But what kind of law? By a law of works. I'm sorry, question. By, the, by a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Be to God. Gospel according to St. John, the eighth chapter. Lord, you will wipe away our sins. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for the hymn of the day.
mercy and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today in the gospel, uh, the audience listening to Jesus uh, say this, we are offspring of Abraham and never been enslaved to anyone. So I want to begin by talking about the offspring of Abraham, but I'm, I'm not meaning necessarily the patriarch from the Old Testament. I'm talking about the offspring of this Abraham. I have three sons who are my offspring. And two out of three of them wanted to play basketball on a team this year. They're in different age groups, but 50 bucks each. All right? I'm thrilled about it. Uh, they're going to be on a team. They're going to learn to be know what it means to be on a team. They're going to get lots of exercise. They're going to have to learn what it means to have a coach. So it's all good. I love it. Now, I live in Lake Tansy, but their basketball practice is all the way out on Potato Farm Road. So that's a, a huge distance, a long drive. So it gives me time to talk to my sons, my oldest offspring and my youngest offspring, offspring of Abraham. And as I'm talking to them, uh, the other day we're going out to practice. My older son, he's sitting in the back. Uh, he's a little long-faced. I make that observation. I say, you, you don't seem like you're uh, looking forward to practice tonight. Are you having fun with this? Yeah, I guess. Well, what's wrong? I mean, this was something you really wanted to do. And he said, I'm just worried that I'm going to let the team down or I don't really always understand what the coach is putting on me or asking me to do. And, you know, it's, it's new for him. This is a new sport for him. For him. He's never played it before. And he's just a little worried about his performance. And so I let that percolate for a few minutes. And uh, when I parked the car at the practice, my youngest offspring, offspring of Abraham, jumped out of the car, ran into the gym. That's his stuff. And that gave me and my oldest offspring an opportunity to chat a little bit. And I said, you know, I didn't pay 50 bucks <laughs> for you to be stressed out about something. I want you to have fun. And of course, yeah, you know, your team is counting on you. And yes, your coach is going to blow his whistle at you. And he's going to have expectations. And he's going to work you hard. And you need to do what he says. You need to be obedient to his commands. And you need to strive to improve and to do better. All that is true. But I didn't pay 50 bucks for you to be stressed. I did it so that you can have a fun, positive experience. And I think hopefully maybe that impacted him some. But in a way, that's kind of what I hear Jesus saying to us today. If the Son makes you free, then you are free indeed. Do you even hear that? And, and I know that as sinners, we're all tortured by the law. That is so much of what the Apostle Paul is saying in his letter to the Romans which was just read to us, such as in verse 20, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Do you hear that? St. Paul is saying to the Christians in Rome, to the Christians around the Mediterranean world, to the Christians who will be believing in Jesus and disciples of Jesus until the second coming, he wants us to understand that faithfulness to the law does not advance our salvation one inch because none of us can live up to the law perfectly. Therefore, the law is more likely to kill us than to help us. It is through the law that we become knowledgeable of our sin. But really, the law is powerless to help us in our eternal salvation. And it is so important that he understand that. that, that, that to him, it's so important to him that you and I understand that because if we think that we can somehow advance our own salvation by being faithful to the law, then what Jesus did for us and the price he paid for us, which was immense, 
is nothing, means nothing. In fact, in Galatians, this is a verse that I go over in my mind every single night before I go to bed. He says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness, this is St. Paul in Galatians, if righteousness were through the law, listen to this, if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died to no purpose. So in other words, I go through life and I'm struggling to do well. Kind of like, I don't know, Jesus is my coat, right? Blowing his whistle, telling me to be kind and charitable in my thoughts towards others at Food City or Walmart or some random parking lot or in the midst of some kind of disagreement here at church or within my own family. There's a, a issues on top of issues, right? Layers of, of wonderful dysfunction, right? We're all bracing ourselves for the holidays, right? And here I have my coach encouraging me to do well to pray for those uh, who hurt or offend me, uh, to, be, uh, to exercise custody over my thoughts to the extent that I'm able to, to, to keep at bay uh, lustful inclinations or greed or the desire to gossip or, or whatever it is. But I know that in, at the end of every day, I'm still going to go to bed someone who is corrupted by sin that resides in my flesh. And this is going to be true about me until I'm dead, right? St. Paul says, uh, when, by, when the body dies, sin dies with it, which is to say we are going to be afflicted with the reality of sin until our earthly lives are drawn to a close. Therefore, the law is not able to help me. But Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That really is, is the, the treasure hidden in the field right there. That's it in a nutshell. That's, that's what we're singing about. That's why we're here today. That's what we rejoice. We cannot save ourselves because we all fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus, who is both God and man, he is fully God, he is fully man, he came into our world to do what we ourselves are not able to do, and that is to save us. But here's the thing, Jesus is both God and man, he can do it. And that is the truth of the gospel. Jesus Christ is competent to save my soul, which is crucial because I can't do it for myself and I myself am profoundly afflicted with sin and that's just the reality. But he can do it. He is able to do it. He came into the world for that purpose. St. Paul says, 1 Timothy this saying is true and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And we believe that Jesus is in fact able to do that. But that hasn't always been clear. I mean, it, it seems simple enough. But the whole issue of the Reformation rests on that one thing that had become elusive for so long. Now you look at Luther's life as an example. He wanted to please God. It's so very important to him to do that. He actually, Luther was fearful of judgment from God. I mean, I think that we all are. We're all kind of innately fearful of being judged harshly by God. Uh, Luther, maybe more so than the average person. He was really tortured. He was also fearful of death. He was fearful of eternal darkness. Uh, in some ways, I've read 
that he was more fearful of death and the possibility of non-existence beyond the grave than he was of hell himself. But he was fearful of these things. And so he was very anxious. And for good reason. He wanted to please God. And he became a monk. And he didn't just become a monk. He became like a champion of monastic practice. I mean, he would deprive himself of food for unhealthy periods of time. He would punish himself. He would be up all night in prayer. He would actually literally cause harm to his body, uh, slapping himself on the back with some kind of terrible device uh, in order to curb some of his innate uh, lustful inclinations or, or whatever it is that was torturing him. He did whatever he could, but all it led to was a kind of personal hatred for God. He realized day after day that he's just always a sinner and God is, 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 is righteous and, and there's no coming together. He is so completely undeserving and God is so holy and righteous and there is no way Luther would ever feel as though he had completely pleased God. And therefore, he was constantly, daily tortured. But he studied Paul. He was a great scripture scholar. And he wanted to study Paul. And he wanted to know what does it mean to be righteous before God. And then suddenly it became clear to him. It's like one of the greatest moments in the history of Western civilization. In fact, if you look at Time Magazine and Life Magazine and, and, and some of these uh, long-standing periodicals, uh, when we got to the year 2000, they would provide lists of the most influential people uh, over the last thousand years in the Western world. Luther is always ranked as like number two or three. Did you know that? I mean, he had an enormous impact on society, on, on the way society relates to itself, as a matter of fact. And it's all because of this one glorious insight that I want you to have, that I need you to have, that St. Paul himself is impressing upon you through great epistles like his letter to the Romans. Or if you want, this book right here is so grand. I, I just, other than the Bible itself, to me, it's, it's really probably the greatest book ever. I'm going to give it to you real quick in a nutshell. It's perfect. It's simple. It's beautiful. Jesus told the parable of a man. It's one verse parable. Walking through the field. And inadvertently he discovers a treasure. He goes and sells all he owns and buys that field. This is the treasure. Okay. If you have this book, and I hope you do. It's called Luther's Small Catechism with Explanation. The treasure is summarized perfectly, sublimely, in question number 206. I'm going to read it for you. This is the essence of the letter to Romans. This is the essence of the letter to Galatians. This is the essence of the Reformation itself. And in my opinion, this is what it means to be a Christian. And to be saved. Question 206. Piece of cake. How is it possible. For a just and holy God. To declare sinners righteous. Remember we all fail the law. The law is not going to save us. The law is more likely to kill us. That's what St. Paul said. And so you understand that that's actually a very good question. So how is it possible for God to declare us righteous? How can we really be saved? That was Luther's conundrum. It is the conundrum of every sinner. But this is the answer. It's so simple. It's so perfect, it's so beautiful, and it's so true. Answer. God declares sinners righteous for Christ's sake. That is, 
our sins have been imputed or charged to Christ the Savior and Christ's righteousness has been imputed or credited to us. So that's what St. Paul essentially is saying in verse 22 of Romans chapter 3. So let's just look at it real quick. It was read to us a moment ago, but let's look at it. Verse 22. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Which is to say that when we believe that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Not only that, but that he is perfectly competent to do that. Again, Jesus, you know sometimes I wish I were a Baptist priest. <laughs> for this reason only when something that awesome is said it has to be punctuated with an amen we don't do that in the Lutheran church but the Baptists do but let's try it amen. <laughs> hey, let me say it first all right? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and he is perfectly competent to do that amen. thank you he came into the world and he fulfilled God's law. You and I have not been able to. That's what St. Paul said. That's what he meant when he says all fall short of the glory of God. We can. We strive, right? My son strives right now to be a good basketball player. To do well on the team and to please his coach. But he's, he's not going to be Michael Jordan at the end of the season. He's not going to be the world's most perfect basketball player. But he strives. You and I, we strive to live up to the commandments. We, we pray for God's help. And we try to curb uncharitable or lustful or greedy thoughts. We try not to be selfish. We try to be kind. We try to live as Jesus would have us live. He's, he's our coach teaching us how to be his disciple. But at the end of the day, we're all still going to fail. But Jesus came into this world he fulfilled God's commandments perfectly. Actually, we believe this about Jesus, that he satisfies God's will for us in two ways. First, actively by being perfectly faithful to God's commandments. He never sinned. He never violated the commandments. So that's one thing that he did. The other way in which he was completely obedient to God, we call, the, his, we call that his passive obedience. He suffered and died on the cross in order to pay the penalty for our sins in our stead. So in those two ways, Jesus was perfectly obedient. Now, his love for sinners is so great. That's just who Jesus is. I mean, I, we can't psychoanalyze him. But he just, he loves sinners. That's who he is. His heart is tender for sinners. Uh, some people, maybe they're, they're attracted to uh, achievement junkies and, and people who have brilliant resumes and are hugely, massively successful in their careers and in their academic performance and in every other possible way, right? But Jesus, he has it bad. <laughs> For people who are the dregs, people who are really struggling, people who fail again and again, Jesus has just a, a kind of love for, for sinners. And, and really, I mean, that's, that's all of us. We, we are so profoundly wounded by the reality of sin, and that has been true since the Garden of Eden. And this just presses on his heart so much. That he is willing to bestow on us his perfect obedience to God. So that you and I are reckoned by God as righteous for the sake of Christ. His perfect righteousness is given to us. That is what Luther realized in his study of Paul. And that is what created the Reformation. And that is why we are here today. That one simple fundamental truth that we are sinners before God. And as such, it's a hopeless situation except that Jesus came into the world to save us, which is something that he is able to do. 
And in so doing, he gives us his own righteousness so that we are saved, not because of a righteousness from within ourselves, but because we are covered in the righteousness of Christ. And the inverse is true also. That our sin, our guilt, our lack of obedience now becomes Christ. And he suffered mightily for it on the cross. But you know what? That's okay. Because that's how he wanted it to be. That's how he wanted it to be. So if we go through life with long faces and fearful of judgment and thinking, I'm just such a terrible person, and the devil has us by the juggler, creating all this self-loathing and personal shame because of our sins, then you might hear Jesus saying to you what I said to my son. Do you remember? I said, this is not why I paid 50 bucks for you to be miserable. This is supposed to be fun. This is supposed to be a positive experience for you. Just do the best you can. It'll be fun. Jesus is up in heaven looking down on us broken sinners and he's saying, you know, why are you fearful of judgment from God? That's not why I shed my blood. That's not why I paid the price that I did. I did it to set you free from your guilt, from your sins, from your transgressions, from your fear of death and judgment. And the devil, he can say whatever he wants. He can say you're worthless. God doesn't really love you. I mean, his goal always is the same, to separate us from God so that we would isolate and turn away from God's love and friendship. But God is is like, I'm not judging you harshly. There was a harsh judgment for your sin, and it was 100% taken out on Jesus. That's what Paul meant in Galatians which I spoke to you earlier, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died to no purpose. But you and I don't believe that. We don't believe that Jesus died for nothing. He died so that we would be free. So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. And I understand that you're a sinner, I'm a sinner, we all sin, we all fail, we we all making a lot of really boneheaded mistakes or we all have things deep within us that we would never want to share with any other human being okay that's true about all of us but we do not ever have to worry about our salvation because Jesus came into the world to save sinners and he's able to do that and in fact he has done it he's done it so don't worry about your salvation if you look in your in your program under sermon, there's a, a beautiful blue box. These are just a few of my favorite selections from writings in the 16th century. And we're only going to look at that, that first comment there. Uh, you have the other two to look at at your leisure. But this is from the Formula of Concord, which was written in 1576. And the statement, and this is what you would call one of our Lutheran confessions. But the statement is, Our righteousness before God is this. God forgives us out of pure grace without any work, merit, or worthiness of ours preceding, present, or following. He presents and credits to us the righteousness of Christ's obedience. It's ours now. Christ's obedience is mine. I take it from, I claim ownership of it because that's what Jesus wants me to do. Because of this righteousness, we are received into grace by God and regarded as righteous. You know what? I said we would only look at one point. Let's look at that other one, too. The middle one. And then I promise I'll stop. I really like this one, though. I I keep this one uh, on the inside of my devotion book. We believe, teach, and confess that many weaknesses and defects cling to the true believers and truly regenerate, even up to the day they are buried. That means we're just always sinful. That's what that statement says. We are just always, always sinful. Even on our best days. Still, they must not on that account doubt 
either their righteousness, which has been credited to them through faith, or the salvation of their souls. Man, if I had that growing up. I grew up in the Catholic Church. We didn't have that. And I regret that so bitterly because this is the greatest, this is the treasure in the field. They must regard it as certain that for Christ's sake, according to the promise and immovable word of the Holy Gospel, they have a gracious God. I'm just going to let that sit there. Because it's the greatest, it's the greatest thing ever. They must regard it as certain that for Christ's sake, according to the promise and immovable word of the Holy Gospel, they, meaning sinners, you and I, have a gracious God. Just let it sit there. Finally, my friends, the Lord is in hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every way, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please rise for the prayer of the church. O oh God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Also Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Grant us your spirit, gracious Father, that we may give heed to the testament of your Son in true faith and above all, firmly take to heart the words with which Christ gives to us his body and blood for our forgiveness. By your grace, lead us to remember and give thanks for the boundless love which he manifested to us when, by pouring out his precious blood, he saved us from your righteous wrath and from sin, death, and hell. Grant that we may receive the bread and wine that is his body and blood as a gift, guarantee, and pledge of his salvation. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us to you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying. Drink of it all of you. 
This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.